I am joining the many folks on YouTube that have a video on pirate weapons. Yes, I know this topic has been covered many times on many different channels. And I usually agree with them about 90%, some of them may be less, but the better ones about 90% of the time. Weapons in the Golden Age of Piracy get interesting because there's a difference between what a sailor would have versus what a pirate would have as their personal weapons. Further, there are vast differences in experience and training across nations, across classes. We are mainly going to focus on English sailors and English pirates. When we talk about the Age of Sail, we are focused on the weaponry, we're focused on the war. It is very important to note from the beginning that your job as a sailor, even as a pirate, was to keep the ship moving. Your job was not to fight. That was a secondary job. Your primary job was to keep the ship moving. So let's begin with the stick. I know within the uh, YouTube weapons community, big sticks have become a bit of a meme. But when it comes to sailors, this was more than likely the only personal weapon you had outside of the next one. Sticks can be traced as far back as there are trees. <laughs> I'm probably going to leave that. It's very simple to grab a stick and use it as a tool. If you're a sailor and you've been on, even if, for anybody who's ever been on a boat for longer than 10 minutes, I'm sure you come onto the pier and you have the Jack Sparrow thing going on. A stick is very important if you've been out at sea for a very long time. At the beginning at least, it's a necessary item to stay on your feet. The best part about a stick is, even in areas where weapons were not allowed, and yes, there were weapons bans, if you were a sailor on a private ship, the weapons on the ship weren't even yours. But a stick could be yours. Throughout the Age of Sail, you see sticks made of varying materials, varying quality. A lot of times they'd find exotic wood and make a stick out of it as a souvenir to bring home. This one is from, I believe about the early 19th century, so a little out of our time period, but it's, it's a very basic stick. It's very much in line with what a sailor would have had throughout much of the 17th and 18th century. And this one, as you can see, is capped with silver. And it's actually weighted. <laughs> this stick was designed as a weapon. Now, in a later video, we will probably go into techniques of fighting with the stick, accounts from the time period, but we're going to try to keep this video as an introduction. In a world of rope and canvas, a knife is one of the most important tools you can have. These are some of the generic reproductions you can get very easily from most vendors online. I have yet to find a, a nicer one that I like, so for now, these are a good placeholder.
there are quite a few accounts of sailors being told to take the tips off their knives. In some cases, this was a matter of insurance policy. The captain didn't necessarily want the crew to get into the stash of alcohol and have a disagreement with each other, and then they'd be out personnel. But when you're climbing, and you need to cut a rope, you don't want to have a point that could end up in you. You're in a rocking ship. As many of my fellow history YouTubers have remarked, slashing is the natural instinct. Now, with a knife, stabbing is, but it's very easy to adjust. Folding knives go back to antiquity. Would the sailor have a folding knife or a fixed blade knife? All depend on personal taste. Some had springs, some did not have springs. It varied. But they were all useful tools as well as weapons when needed. Let's talk about improvised weapons. Before we begin, I want to give a shout out to a lot of naval reenactors who insist on carrying belaying pins. Those are part of the ship. You do not take the part of the ship. You need those on the ship. Now, if your ship's getting overrun and you have nothing else, I'm pretty sure the captain wouldn't mind you trying to protect the ship with part of the ship. I've heard men, people have mentioned, oh, well, a marlin spike, in this case, a fid. Marlin spikes are typically metal. Did they exist in the time period? Yes. I know some people are going to go, metal marlin spikes did not exist. There's documentation from as early as Jamestown, possibly earlier, but looking in the context of North America, at least Jamestown, it's, they're calling for, forget if they specifically said iron Marlin spikes or iron fids, but they did exist. Fids, marlin spikes, they vary in size. You use them to tie rope. In some cases, you might use them to expand a hole and then tie a grom uh, sew a grommet. Could these be used as a weapon? Yeah, but you'd probably be better off with a knife. Some of the larger Fids could probably be used as a makeshift club. There is a bit of a point to it, so perhaps the stab, but you're talking about layers of clothing. As I went over in the last video, we're not talking about just somebody wearing just a shirt. This is not just going to have a hard time going through wool. Will it hurt? Yes. Yes, I know, I already talked about knives. These are actually hunting knives or butchering knives. These are not designed for fighting. Trade knives in general, they are optimized to be multi-purpose. Trade knives are not specifically designed to be used in hand-to-hand -hand combat. They're used so that the owner can butcher meat, carve wood, and if necessary, fight. I'm grouping these with improvised weapons. They often appear on trade manifests. We have plenty of images of buccaneers carrying very similar knives. Are they the best? Definitely not. Definitely not. But will they work? Yes. For the sake of documented improvised weapons. We can't forget Captain Kidd. The murder Captain Kidd was tried for involved him killing a crew member with a bucket. Not too dissimilar from this one. The one he would have used would have likely had wooden bands. These are metal. In short, improvised weapons could be basically anything you get your hands on. In Black Sails, when Captain Flint grabs the cannonball, 
that is an example of an improvised weapon. Many fights break down very quickly. Uh, it ceases to be about fluid movement and becomes more about, I need to stop this person from hurting me. Fights on ships were well within the range of, if I don't neutralize the threat, I'm going to be neutralized. I've been debating where to put the axe in the context of maritime weapons of this time period. I'm sure some of you are probably going to say, well, boarding axes, everyone had those, right? The documentation for the late 17th to early 18th century is limited on specific boarding axes. There are a few which are documented, but they're not as common in all navies. What there is a lot of reference to are trade axes. Trade axes appear very early on with, with colonial settlers. They were traded with Native Americans. They were traded throughout the Caribbean, Africa, Asia. These would have been on just about any ship that was trading. There are some prints from Charles Johnson which do show pirates carrying, essentially, again, tomahawks. Are these accurate depictions? This is something we are not entirely sure of. We know axes were around. We do know that they were used in conflict on ships. Many times these were carpentry axes. These were hatchets. These were tools first, weapons second. Something like this is more general purpose than that. I actually like this repro because it doesn't have the features of a lot of later style boarding axes. This is more of a trade axe. Props to Townsend's. Those of you who follow historical accounts on YouTube are probably familiar with Townsend's. This is from their, their store. I'm not a big fan of the width of the handle, but overall, for the price, for what it's supposed to represent, especially for this time period, I like it. I like it. Wood axes have been available to the crew on a ship, almost definitely. You needed axes to gather wood. You needed axes to fight fires. The carpenter needed axes. These would have probably been one of the more common, heavier bladed weapons on ships, especially those that weren't necessarily funded well enough to have racks of cutlasses. So having an axe would not be out of the question. Let's talk about what probably a good chunk of you have come here for, swords. Most sailors did not own their own swords. Most sailors, to get back to one of my earlier points, their primary job was to sail the ship. They were not training every hour of every day on how to use a blade. They were doing basic tasks like fixing the rigging, mopping the deck, cooking food, trying to stop themselves from making a mess all over the place. It could be a very nasty job. Standing on a deck, swinging a blade around, was not something a lot of captains wanted to deal with. A few videos have been made of, oh, well, they had this sword, and this sword was an option, this sword was an option. We will very likely do a video where, with some folks who actually have training in small swords, rapiers, etc. For right now, we are going to focus on the cutlass, or more appropriately, the hanger. This is a back sword, but it's a hanger. This is a hunting sword, but it is also a hanger. And this has a saber blade, but this is also considered to be a hanger. These are all single-edged slashing weapons. Some of them, all of them in fact, could, can be used for a stab, but mostly they are designed for slashing. 
This is what you hand to somebody who has no clue what they are doing. Unless their job is to be a soldier, or a mercenary in some cases, they would not actually be, they would not actually own their own swords. Now, when you get into fishermen, smaller merchant companies, especially in the colonies, yes, the crew might own their own blades. It was expected with a lot of militia for them to provide a hanger from home. A few other words to consider when discussing these, especially these two. Uh, Matt Easton at Scala Gladiatoria has brought up Curlax, Cuddleax, Cutto. Some of these were also referred to as machetes in the time period, and cutlasses, of course. Today, would we identify this as a machete? Absolutely not, but it was designed to have that purpose. It's, it's a very utilitarian blade. It's thick enough to be used as a tool, but it's just thin enough and balanced enough to be used as a weapon. A boar is charging at you, there you go. You're trying to cut through some brush, there you go. Hunting swords do appear in some of the cargo manifests. They would have been shipped to all the colonies. These would have been a tool for lack of a better term, that could be found on just about any trading ship. I actually based my modification on this hunting sword off of some of the artifacts from Queen Anne's Revenge. So we know that pirates did have access to them. Did they use them? According to some of the images of the buccaneers, absolutely. Let's talk about things that go boom. It is very unlikely if you were a normal legal sailor that you would have access to your own pistol. Would most ships have some of these on hand? Yes. Would they be yours? No. You couldn't walk into town carrying one of these. It's one of the most common things that separates pirates from normal sailors is the access to personal weapons, personal firearms. This is a repro of a Queen Anne pistol. The original would have had a screw on barrel. Which allowed you to breech load it. Even then, in combat on a ship, many times these would have only been fired once and then the blade drawn. I was debating on whether or not to actually put swords after pistols, but in many cases it might have been the sword and no pistol. <laughs> the images of the buccaneers often show them with the pistol from a left hand draw and the sword from a right hand draw. As somebody who has been around weapons, this to me says that the sword is more primary than the pistol. Pistol, you're only getting one shot. If you are at that distance where the pistol is effective, you're already too close. One shot might be used to hopefully hit a target, if not scare them off, and then this becomes a parrying weapon for your sword. At the Witter Wreck, there is confirmation of Charles Johnson's claim of pirates using a silk scarf to hold their pistol. I promise I would not criticize some of the other channels, but there's a continuous belief of pirates and sailors just dropping their pistol. No, you wouldn't do that. This, number one, this is still a weapon. 
even though its primary function is gone, it is still a weapon. Number two, it's expensive. You don't want to, even though it's a pistol, it's small, it's still expensive. You don't want to lose it. In some cases, if it's an issued weapon from the ship, you definitely don't want to lose it. Once it has been fired, you could stash it just about anywhere on your person. If you imagine pirates is just running around in shirts, oh, certainly there's nowhere to put it. But most sailors were wearing at least a jacket. Their trousers also had pockets. This had some place to go. Now, when you're talking about a horse pistol, that's an entirely different story. I've heard from my friends from the Netherlands that, yes, these were actually popular with Dutch sailors. I know I was going to focus on the British, but it's an English lock. And there are still document. There's evidence of larger pistols being carried by pirates, by sailors. This is something that would almost definitely be held in a sling or stuffed into a belt. During the English Civil War, there were saddle holsters for these. There is some debate over how common they were afterward. I know there are some content creators as well as authors who mention the use of wheel locks. Wheel locks, for the most part, died out by roughly the 1660s. When you're talking about the Buccaneers, yes, it's very likely there'd be a few around, especially in the hands of legitimate colonies. We're talking English, we're talking the Spanish, possibly the French. A lot of your older weapons from Europe would get shipped to the colonies. Wheel locks, though, were expensive. They were not something that were just handed general issued. They were probably more valuable as Look at this. I'm going to go sell this. <laughs> Another sort of weapon that gets mentioned are match locks. Yes, we know the Spanish were using match locks throughout much of the 17th and early 18th century, as well as the English. Once more, the colonies were often getting shipped older weapons to outfit their militia. In, King's Philip, in King Philip's War, there's reference to the Native Americans having better weapons than the English colonists they were fighting. They were getting flintlocks from the Dutch traders. This is where we're going to split a little bit in our discussion of primary and secondary weapons. If you were a sailor, your job, once more, is to take care of the ship. That is your primary weapon. If you're a buccaneer, on the other hand, you are first and foremost a hunter. Now this is a English dog lock, a reproduction of an English dog lock. It's well within the size of buccaneer guns of the time period. Most of your buccaneer muskets in this time period, or buccaneer guns rather, would have been made with a flintlock. These were purchased from the French and the Dutch. The French made buccaneer guns were extremely popular in North America in general. They even appear in arsenals as late as the American Revolution. Other cases though, you might end up with a dog lock. These were commonly made by the English, sometimes by the Dutch. There are quite a few accounts of buccaneers practicing on fruit hanging out of trees. Their accuracy was legendary, even among Spanish sources. Another thing that increased the buccaneer firepower was the use of paper cartridges. Many standing European armies and colonial militia were still using bandoliers. These are also known as apostles. It comes from some of them having 12 
12 apostles. They were called bandoliers in the time period. To load with a bandolier, you would take your priming flask. You would load from your priming flask. You would put the weapon in half cock. I'm not going to do this because I know how YouTube can be sometimes. <laughs> you would take one of the single charges. Let's call it an apostle for now. And you'll take one of the apostles, pour it in. That is the shot. That's usually the powder. Then you pull your shot from your shot pouch, put that in, ram it home, then you fire. And when I say ram it home, you're using the ramrod. This is important. Now, for some of you who are familiar with loading techniques of the American Revolution, of the Civil War, this may at first sound very familiar to you, but there's a step that gets skipped. Buccaneers would bite the end off the cartridge, prime the pan, pull down the frizzen, pour the powder in, remove the ball, let the ball fall down, give it a good tap. Keep in mind, if it's a French or Dutch lock, it's got the half cock, which is this on a dog lock. This is actually a safety. There's a very low chance of it going off doing that. Don't try that at home. You do not know the quality of your musket. They would tap it down, bring it to full, and then fire. That step, skipping the step of actually using the ramrod, saved them a lot of time. Keep in mind, these are people who did train with their weapons on a regular basis. They weren't training so much with their swords, but they were training with their muskets. They were notoriously accurate. They were able to fight ships from small boats using these weapons. That's why I count these as the Buccaneer's primary arm as opposed to the ship. There's very few instances of Buccaneers having ship-to-ship -ship combat. In many times they were operating more as Marines than sailors. It's also been described that Buccaneers were horrible sailors. Now this is a later brown bess, but it fits for the time period. Many of the weapons available on merchant ships, naval ships, many of the long arms available on merchant ships and naval ships would have been of a shorter variety. Some would have almost definitely had muskets. But there's a good chance if you were on a ship, you'd find something like this. Roughly the same size, maybe a little longer. If it's a blunderbuss, it's got a flared barrel. It makes loading on a ship easier. This would have been the sort of long arm you would start seeing more into the early 18th century. It's not really a long arm. <laughs> Again, you're a sailor. Your job is to defend the ship. Nothing else. The ship is your home. If you're a buccaneer, the land is your home. Let's talk about Granados. Granados were typically hollowed out metal balls with a wooden plug and a fuse. You'd see some made from glass, some from ceramic. They varied. Pretty much whatever was available at the time. Some were improvised, some were purpose-built. Some were basically sealing ammunition from the swivel guns, even smaller cannon. Some people have downplayed them as mostly noise. But these would have been full of shrapnel. These would have acted very much as their modern counterparts. Would there be a chance of the fuse getting wet and not going off? Would there be a chance of it being cut too short and it going off in your hand? Oh, certainly. 
But these were very popular at sea for much longer than they were on land. There was a time where they faded out of use on land, but they continued to be used at sea. That concludes the video for today. I hope you all enjoyed it. If you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comments. Check us out on Facebook. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, share. Take care, y'all. Have an awesome day.